welcome to the Brock Interview Series with host Thomas S. Orwatt Jr. Welcome to episode number 85 of the Rock Interview Series. I'm Thomas Orwatt Jr. It is October 18th, 2023. And for this feature, I have guitar virtuoso Ron Bumblefoot Thal as my guest. During his career, Ron has established himself as a successful solo artist and also been a member of the legendary rock bands Guns N' Roses and Asia, and also Sons of Apollo and Art of Anarchy. During this epic interview, Ron talks about his band Art of Anarchy and their new single and video, Vilified, and also their upcoming full-length release. In addition, Ron talks about many aspects of his 40-year-plus long career, and reveals the top six at the moment favorite records of all time. So here he is, Ron Bumblefoot Thal. Before we get started, please subscribe to the Rock Interview Series. Hey everyone, welcome to the Rock Interview Series, and we have another great special today. We have Ron Bumblefoot Thal with us today, and uh, there he is. He's pretty excited. I'm pretty excited too. I've been wanting to interview for a long time. Actually, actually, today is uh, my birthday, so this is my birthday gift to myself to be, to be able to interview you on my birthday. So it's your birthday. Hang on. Uh oh. Woo! Oh boy. Happy birthday to you. Wow. I don't think any gift could possibly All right. happy birthday. Think... Great, Thank you. I, I don't think any gift could possibly top that. Are you kidding me? That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of gifts oh. could top that, but oh no, that that was great. All right. Well, <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but um, but thank you so much. That was very cool. Um, very I want to um talk about obviously about your new new band. Uh, well, that's not a new band, but it's a, a new release from a band that you've been involved with. Uh, the new for a while. old band. Yeah, new old band, right? And and a band, uh, Art of Anarchy, which has been uh has this will be a third release coming out. You've released uh, so far one single from it, uh, Vilified, which is absolutely awesome. Great, great song. Um. And a video for it as well, which is not just like any music video. It's like a, a mini movie almost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been a long time coming, this record, and a lot of... Uh, it was a tough rocket to launch, <laughs> this whole band. I mean, even if you want, I'll take you to the very beginning, where it began. So it was 2011, and John... Voda, the guitar player, and Vince Voda, his twin brother, the drummer, they've been playing together all their lives, and I've known them since they were teenagers. And so over a good 25 years or so. And I used to record their band at my studio back then, and we always stayed friends, and their family is wonderful and everything. And then in 2011, they hit me up. They said, we have this album that we always wanted to make. And it's just, we, we, we wrote 10 songs and we want to get all different singers to sing on it and just put it out ourselves and just make the, our dream album. So I was like, yeah, come on in. So they're just right behind me on that gray rug is where the drums were set up for like a year and a half in case they needed to do any tweaks. Uh, recorded the music. I laid some guitar into it also. And then we started reaching out to singers. So the original idea was not to have this be a band. It was really just them wanting to make the album they always wanted to make. So we reached out to different singers. The first one to say yes was Scott Weiland. And he did a song called Till the Dust is Gone. There's a video of it too. Uh, he did such a great thing to that song. And he just did something I never would have imagined for that song. It was fantastic. and. Then, you know, we were dealing a lot with, you know, his representation, his manager and everything. And, and the manager said to us, said, why don't we make this a band? Let's turn this into a band. And Scott will do the whole album and we'll put it out and, as a band. It's like, oh, great. Who's going to say no to that? Yeah. So it became a band. We got John Moyer from Disturbed on bass and we finished up the album. And 
after all the papers were signed and everything was in agreement and everything was good, just suddenly it took this unexpected turn and there was turbulence with that and Scott Weiland was denying he was even in the band. And so it's like, all right, well, what do we do? Do we let it die or do we get another singer? And we got another singer and went through more of similar kinds of issues. And that was, by that point, the second album came out in 2017. And then it's like, all right, we need to just kind of hang this up until we could clear it up and, and get things right. So in 2019, the end of 2019, John, the guitar player, he got very sick and doctors couldn't diagnose it. They couldn't figure out what it was, but he was just slowly dying. Every part of him was shutting down. He was too weak to get out of bed. He was, he had to have his brother or his dad like staying in the room with him because sometimes he would just start choking and couldn't breathe. He was going blind like all this crazy stuff. And they couldn't figure out what it was. And all he could do is just lay in bed, playing guitar, watching movies, and just trying to take his mind off what was happening. And he would watch the Joker movie over and over. He would just keep watching the Joker movie. And as he would watch it, he would just play guitar to it. And if you watch a movie a hundred times playing guitar to it, eventually ideas start to formulate and stick and solidify. Next thing you know, he was writing these definite riffs while watching this movie and the opening scene, the guitar part that he wrote became the song vilified. And after a couple of months, they figured out what was going on and he had to get some aggressive treatment to you know, get his, his body back. And of course, this was right as the pandemic was hitting and he couldn't even get into a hospital to get the treatments. And so that was pretty scary as well. And then his immune system was shot. So if he did get COVID, it probably would have killed him. So he was worried about that. <laughs> so it was a tough time for the guy. And once he was well enough, uh, John and Vince, they came back into the studio and wanted to record this idea that came about from watching this movie over and over in the darkest time of his life. And they recorded it. And from there, every Friday, they would come over and by 10 o'clock at night, we would have another song recorded and finished. And we ended up doing that for a good half a year and a good two albums worth of music. So meanwhile, I have the band had been Sons of Apollo with Jeff Scott Soto, the singer. And he knew all the problems we were having with the band, with personnel. And, and he always said to me, he said, you know, if you just got me to sing, it would have been smooth, it would have been fine. The albums would have been done in time. You would have done shows. It wouldn't have been all this crazy stuff. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he said it again, and, and I mentioned it to John and Vince, said, you know, Jeff said, if you're looking for singer number three, uh, if you're looking for Scott number three, and I mean, Scott's his middle name, but if he still qualifies to be in the band, and they said, of course, he's in. No questions asked. If he wants in, he's in, he's the singer. So from there, started showing him all the music that we were recording, and he just started writing to it all. And we ended up with another album done. Uh, John Moyer, he did, uh, he was not going to continue with the band. So, uh, love the guy. Actually, we just did a song together. It's coming out on the 27th. Uh, it's this sort of rock rap kind of song from a guy named Jared Anthony. And our friend Daryl McDaniels from Run DMC, he did vocals on it and Doc Coyle laid some extra guitar on it. And I did all the lead guitar and the mixing and everything. And yeah, so that's all cool. We're, we're cool. And we needed a new bass player though. So uh, Jeff recommended his own bass player from his Soto uh, solo band that he has. A guy named Tony Dickinson, who is phenomenal. They're both in Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Uh, the new Mike Mangini album that just came out, Tony's the bass player on it, and he's just a fantastic guy, funny as hell, and killer player, killer player. So in a week, he banged out the whole album, boom, 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 done. 
And that's it. Then figuring out what to do from there, we were talking to our good friend, uh, Dale Restigini, who is the video director that did the video and he did almost all of our videos since the very beginning. And he recommended we contact the company Pavement, Pavement Entertainment. They do plush, they do a whole lot of bands and artists. And they took us on and they've been fantastic. And it's been a great team. So yeah, so that is how the whole thing came back. Through near death comes album number three. <laughs> and the video, that was Dale's creation. He uh, just hearing the song and what it was about, uh, he just had this idea of just really attacking uh, mental health and specifically uh, PTSD and things that veterans go through and, and gave it that that turn and got Cuba Gooding Jr. to star in the thing where he is suffering. Uh, he's ready to end it all. And the uh, police are aware of this and they want to get in and they're armed as well because he is and it probably wouldn't end well. And and from there, uh, his daughter kind of breaks through everybody and runs into the house. And they're like, no, no. And they see each other and, and it brings them back to, to what matters. And, and it's just, it's real shit. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and the, the lyrics that Jeff wrote are all about vilification of people, how we don't understand each other. We don't listen to each other. We just condemn and just treat people like monsters that we don't agree with. And that's something also that heavily needs to be addressed in humanity. Yeah. The video, we shot the video on the same stairs that the Joker movie was filmed, where they had that scene where he's on the stairs and kicking around and doing his thing. So we shot in the same location. So we shot the video on those same stairs. And the whole thing of watching the Joker movie, how it sort of kept him sane and just kept him focused on something else through that, that dark period. Uh, that's why there's so many Joker references throughout that song. And the news broadcasts about the movie that happened in that song, those were real news broadcasts, but we had them uh, re-spoken by Jeff Tate of Queen's Riot Mind Crime. So if you listen back to the song, a lot of people don't notice. And then you point it out and they're like, oh my God, how did I not realize it's Jeff Tate doing all the, you know, we've been getting blah, 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 and like saying everything like the news broadcasts throughout that song. It's Jeff Tate doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's I, a few I, I, little Easter eggs. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that, that's a, it's a great song and, and Jeff has the right voice for it. And it does give it that um, Operation Mind Crime type of vibe to it, which is, Totally. probably what you were going for i would imagine yeah yeah when is the full length record going to be released mid february 2024 will will there be any um singles released before then with videos hopefully we shot more videos and as you can see from this first one they're pretty big involved <laughs> productions so the next one is still being edited and it's going to be another biggie. So hopefully before the end of the year, that could come out, if not early next year. So yeah, yeah, we have singles ready to go. Yeah. And I, and I really hope that there's going to be some uh, tour plans for, for uh, this also. We're working on that too. We have a great booking agent that's looking into all possibilities for 2024 and just hoping that the, everything can line up where we could either be an opener for a band or a package tour, or if we do headlining shows, whatever it is, whatever we can do. But finally, we have a band where everybody is uh, on board and has the same goal and cares more about the team. So, so it should be all right. Yeah, it, it must have been like heartbreaking to see the two of uh, your first two records kind of fall apart like they did because there's some great material. You had your like A-list singer on the record. I mean, there was a lot of potential. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, like I said, it must be like truly heartbreaking to like go into that thinking like, wow, you know, look at, look who we have, look at the material we have and, and thinking that it was going to be like, you know, really big. And then, then it to be like kind of sabotaged by, you know, I, the singers, you know? Yeah. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Like all the way I look at it always is you just do your best, make the best album you can make, make the best music you can make, best mix you can make, just do your best all across, put it out there into the universe and the universe decides what's going to happen from there. And no matter how much we love the album, it's up to people. If they love it and they embrace it, wonderful. If they don't, at least you gave it your best. What you felt was the best thing of who you were at that time and the situations you were in and what you can give musically at that point. So that's what we did. And yeah, there were definitely challenges. And there always are. There's always going to be some kind of challenge. Nothing is easy. And especially when there's so many moving parts to a band, besides just the personnel, but you have all the business people, and then you have all the outside people that you're trying to connect with to make it happen. You have other bands and booking agents and promoters and, and publicists and this and that. And there's so many moving parts. So it's so easy for things to screw up and not happen and not work out. And it's really triumphant when it does uh, for any band out there. I applaud them for getting out and doing what they're doing. And, and we just want to do the same. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully this time we'll actually get to do it right. When the first record um was recorded and released uh, with Scott Whelan, was there any apprehension because of his past reputation of getting him involved in the in the project? After he sang that first song and did such an amazing thing with it, uh, felt pretty good about it. And he finished up the album in like a month. He would just sing everything at his place and, and they would send me the tracks and it was great. So, yeah. But now with Jeff Scott Soto, there are no worries, no concerns, no anything. And I've worked with the guy for years and I can vouch for him 100% in every aspect of everything that he is reliable, dependable, wonderful, uh, great soul, great voice, uh, wonderful to work with. I can't say enough good about him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just with the material that um, you did with Sons of Apollo with, with Jeff, um, I mean, that, I mean, obviously there's a, a good, like you guys can work together well as a team. Oh yeah. We would have fun on the road and, and even outside of that, when we've done any like acoustic things together and stuff like that and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Before Jeff um, volunteered to get involved, was there any thought of going back to the original idea of having uh, different singers sing the songs on the third record? Not really. No. Never got to that. Like once it became a band, felt like it had to stay a band. Even though it didn't start off with the intention of being a band, but it became one. So, yeah, wanted to just see where it went and the door was open and jeff came knocking yeah right what is the writing you like in the art of anarchy uh it'll be for actually for everything it's usually uh i have john and vince have an idea that they come here with or i have an idea that when they get here it's like hey i got a song idea or we just come up with stuff on the spot it's pretty open yeah, so so shorter version of that is everybody just writes, whoever has ideas. Yeah. Now, Tony, he came to the party after the fact. So for the next album, even though we already have like a ton of music done, I know the guy could write and he's super talented. So he'll be involved as well with everything. So yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. And Jeff, interestingly, he likes to write to finished music. And I always say to him, it's like, hey, we got the song we're working on. Check it out. You got any ideas for this? He's like, I don't want to hear it until it's done. He likes having it until, like, he likes having it finished. He waits until it's done. And then he listens to it and gets a complete picture of the song, where it goes and everything, and starts getting the ideas for it. 
how it makes him feel becomes the lyrical content and the melodies that just fit the vibe. And, and he likes doing it that way. Yeah. As far as tons of uh, Apollo goes, I, I read um, on some previous interviews you've done that, you know, you don't, I mean, right now it doesn't really seem like there's anything in, in uh, any plans for that band at this moment. You know, that's unfortunate because as you probably know, you probably have received a lot of feedback, you know, with people telling you how amazing that project was. Thank you. Uh, everything has its lifespan and you hope it'll be a long one and, and it just ends up being what it's going to end up being. And just like I was saying before about all the moving parts, if one of those parts is not on board, it can't function. So we did two studio albums. We did the live video and album. We did lots of music videos, did a good amount of touring. And now after it has splintered off into other things where Jeff and I are doing Art of Anarchy, Derek and I, there's all of Derek's music that I've been a part of, all his solo music, which is very much, you know, his writing is, is half of Sons of Apollo. Uh, well, I guess you could say a third. You have Derek and, and I, we would do the music writing and then Jeff would write to that. So most of those albums, uh, well, all those albums were done that way, where it was just shooting ideas back and forth. Derek and I, he would have an idea and I would send a demo of an idea and we would make the music and then with Mike, we would get together and arrange them into crazy ass songs. And, and then Jeff would listen to these songs and start putting vocals to it and make them sound like something digestible. Yeah. I, uh, the, one of the reasons that I really was in the Sons of Apollo uh, was the fact that I always thought you and Billy Sheehan would be great together in a band. And, and with me being in Buffalo, I've been following Billy Sheehan since 1979. <laughs> Mm. Saw Talus for the first time opening for UFO or Shays. And I know that you were involved with, with Talus on their reunion. You played a couple, a few, I think a week of gigs with them, correct? Yeah, I think we did. It was five or six shows that I tagged along and would come out and play a couple of songs with them. And yeah, I'm same. I've loved Talus since the first album came out with Sink Your Teeth and High Speed and all of that stuff. MV4, 3345, I learned it on guitar, his bass solo when I was a kid when I heard it. And yeah, always been a big Talis fan. Yeah. Yeah. Talis reunion tour was 2019, March of 2019. Uh, the album, the first Sons of Apollo album came out October 2017. We did a ton of touring throughout 2018. And then March of 2019, we did Talis stuff and started writing all year for uh, the second SOA album, 2020 album. Then we started touring with that. We got four shows in and then the world shut down. And yeah. It, it's, it seems like, uh, again, uh, you have a little bit of bad luck in your career. I mean, you have these, these great records, these great bands, and all of a sudden, like, adversity out of nowhere occurs. Oh, well, I think I have pretty good luck. If you really look at it. We've got to play with wonderful people. We've got to put out albums, things for the things that don't go wrong, a million things go right. I mean, you can look at bands that have had bus accidents where a member dies. That's what I call bad luck. Uh, if a band breaks up that's, and everybody walks away healthy and in one piece and continue to make music, it's not the worst thing in the world. And we all just make more music. So doing stuff with Derek, doing stuff with Jeff. I have a solo album that I'm finishing up that has wonderful guests that I can't wait when the time comes to tell you about. And actually, Derek, I'll say he did play something on that album. And it's all instrumental. It's the first instrumental, fully instrumental album that I've done in almost 30 years. The very first album that I put out was on Shrapnel Records in 1995 called The Adventures of Bumblefoot and really just wacky music. It was some really out there shit. Uh, I've splattered a couple of instrumentals on other albums and certainly got to do instrumental-ish moments with Sons of Apollo. 
but this is the first time that I'm just keeping a big piece of tape over my mouth. And every time I have a melody, instead of saying, oh, I got to sing that, uh, I'm just playing it all on guitar. So I have a finished solo album that I just need to get all the other pieces in place before I put it out. I'm working on a video game for the first single instead of just a music video so that you could really have fun with the song and, and play this video game while you listen to the song. Uh, stuff like that. Like I want it to be special. And working on transcribing, which has been the most difficult thing, just figuring out what I played, writing it all down. As you can see, it has not been easy to figure out what I'm doing. And, and then using Guitar Pro 8 and making all these uh, transcriptions of it so that people can learn how to play the songs as well. So all of that stuff, I'm trying to get a lot of that in order before putting out the album. Wow, so the music is ready to go, but I want to get that stuff ready. Yeah, that's really a lost art to be able to transcribe music like that. I mean, I don't think there's many artists nowadays that can even do that. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, I've I studied from the beginning all the academic stuff. I know how to read. I know how to do, you know, orchestra arrangements and all of that stuff, music for video games and horror movies and things like that. So I'm well versed in writing and reading music. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I worked for a company transcribing their instructional guitar cassettes, making the booklets for them. Uh, so yeah, so it's not difficult to do. It's just the music itself, figuring out what, yeah. Do you find that most people that you work with are able to read music? Uh, I don't know how many read music. I think a lot of them read music, but they know the language where you could say, all right, it goes G, B flat, C, G, B flat, D flat, C. And they know, you know, oh, smoke on the water. Yeah. Like we can get that far. Yeah. It's, it's just that you seem like a little more involved than like, you know, your average musician um, by, by quite a bit. Oh, well, if I could use that to help other musicians. Cool. Yeah. Are, are, do you have uh, any uh, tour plans? Uh, it's a tour solo. I pretty much stopped doing that. So now I'm just saving touring time for the bands that I play with. Before the pandemic, I was never home. I was just constantly just everywhere. I mean, all over the world, jumping from one side to the other constantly and just living out of a suitcase. And I missed a lot of just life, me time, family time, everything. I was an absentee member of my real life. And the pandemic showed me just being home, how much I was actually missing. So I'm holding off. I'm still doing some clinics and things like that. I do music camps. But as far as going back to living like that, I need to have the balance. So I'm staying home as much as I can and putting more time into producing and mixing albums and and being creative, just studio time and home time. And when I have to go out and tour with the bands, I'll, I'll do it. But I, I'm I, not going to add to that. I need to make up for lost decades. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. That, that's one of the um, downfalls of being a tour musician, I guess. I mean, it's not for everyone. I mean, it takes a lot. Yeah, it's, it's you know, you're, it's a choice. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's are you going to have touring or are you going to have everything else and yeah and it's not an easy choice to make either because we all do this for the most part our dream the reason we started making music is we pictured ourselves on stage screaming audience loud music and and just having this incredible moment with tons of people together yeah you mentioned uh, you were doing some producing can you tell me uh like currently what you're what you've been producing what oh bands or yes artists? ah okay first one i'll mention is this band living in southern israel 
uh, God bless them and may they all be safe. Everybody, all of them, everywhere, uh, on both sides. So they're called the Dodies, D-O-D-I-E-S. And they're a garage rock duo that sounds sort of like Nirvana meets Radiohead. They're like noisy and gritty and nasty and attitude and almost punky, but incredibly melodic. The singer, guitar player, his voice has so much dimension to it. Like he has such a range and so much dynamics. Incredible singer. And the drummer, he plays the whole drum set with just one arm while playing bass on a synth with his left hand and singing backing vocals. And they are so locked in and so good. And sometimes he'll grab the drumstick off of the synth and just play like this. And the guitar player will kick on an octave pedal that's running to a bass amp. So they take turns being the bass. And they have this huge sound. And their songs are just so good. So we just finished up doing their third album. And I did the first and second ones. And we go out to Ireland to my friend's studio there. It's like a middle meeting place. And we spend three weeks. Uh, Owen Johnson is the engineer and a dear friend of mine for years. Super talented guy, uh, great musician, great engineer. And he has this wonderful studio that he's just been building and building where you could live there in this beautiful spot in the north end of Ireland. It's so quiet and serene and, and it's just wonderful. And it's a great place to make an album. So we spend a couple of weeks out there recording. And this time they also did a bunch of gigs in between the recording out there. And, and then we bring it back and I sit here and mix it and we just exchange ideas. Hey, let's make this sound more roomy. Let's put distortion on this. Let's flip this in reverse. Let's try this. Let's make this brighter and all that kind of stuff. And our combined ears all working together to make the album sound the way it sounds. And they're a fantastic band that deserves so much more attention. Uh, yeah. So if you look up the Dodies band, anything, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or just the dodiesband.com, the Dodies, D O D I E S band. And they're fantastic. Yeah. So that's one that I can't say enough good stuff about. The other one that I can't say enough good stuff about, she's this 18 year old girl from Ontario, Canada, that is so talented. She's an incredible singer. She can sing heart songs like crazy on you, like it's nothing and even play the guitar intro on acoustic, nail it. Uh, I've been given her guitar lessons for about three years. And she's a great guitar player. She's a fantastic songwriter. She plays piano. She I helped her organize making her own recording studio in her house. So she records and plays drums and everything for her music. So she writes everything. She records and plays all the instruments. And then we mix it together, just doing a Zoom chat thing and, and working on it. And I'll send her a mix and she'll listen to it clearly and then back and do some more changes. And she books her own shows. She is great with music business. She's taking all these Berkeley online courses and she's just like an all around fantastic musician. She's great with all the, the business stuff that needs to get done too. She's with the promoting. She's gotten her stuff on radio as an unsigned daughter. She just released her first single. I should tell you her name too. Uh, she just put out a single called Get Off My Stage, which is such a funny song. What happened was a year ago, I'm going to stop saying she and I'm going to actually say her name is Sierra Levesque and it's spelled L-E-V-E-S-Q-U-E. -E -E. So us Americans, we might say Levesque or something, but it's Le Levesque, Sierra Levesque. Uh, when Machine Gun Kelly switched over to rock and started shit talking people like Corey Taylor and all these rock musicians, she got very offended by that. She's a Corey Taylor fan. So 
she got inspired by that and she wrote a song bashing Machine Gun Kelly, a rock diss song. Like the way rappers write diss songs attacking each other. Well, she made a rock one. It's called Get Off My Stage. And it's all in fun. Uh, it's not cruel, evil, mean, it's, it's lighthearted. But she, she goes at him. And she got that on, now there's like 10 radio stations, like commercial radio that's playing her stuff in Canada. And she's the only unsigned artist that they've ever done that for. And the song is doing pretty well. It's getting you know a lot of spins on Spotify and she's doing a lot of uh, press and everything. I should, I'll connect you to both of those artists because they certainly have good, interesting stories behind what they do. And uh, so Sierra Levesque. So if you look up Sierra Levesque music on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff, uh, and YouTube for both as well, you'll find everything they're doing. Uh, she's been opening for the Killer Dwarfs. They're doing a 40th reunion, 40th anniversary show, 40 years, and they're going to have some original members there. And she opens the show and she joins them for a song. She actually joined LA Guns for a song in LA when they were playing at the Whiskey in April. And she did a cover of Ballad of Jane and, and they saw it and they let her come on stage. She opened the show and they had her do that song with them where she sang and played guitar with the band. She, no matter what direction she goes, she's going to do well because she just has that great work ethic, the good personality, just down to earth and smart and realistic. And she's just a very good person. Her parents are absolutely wonderful. Uh, so, yeah. Those are the two that I've been really working with the most. Yeah. Wow. Those both sound really interesting. I can't wait to check them out as soon as we're done with this interview. Definitely. Um, I'll send you links and everything. Yeah. Especially get your endorsement. I mean, I, I have, I'm, I have to check this out. I'm sure it's going to be amazing as a producer. How, how do you take on a project like that? I mean, with, with two unique artists, do you try to let them do pretty much kind of, uh, keep on their course or do you kind of like you know steer them maybe sometimes in a different direction or do you uh put any musical input in or or does, does it does it like vary depending on the artist it varies but i try to be as invisible as possible and make it just about them uh the vision they have for themselves i'm not trying to change it i'm not trying to change their music i'm just trying to get the best of it out of them and captured so i Really, I like to let them just do their thing. And if something sounds off or if I have a suggestion, I give it. But for the most part, they're the boss. And my job is to just make them be the best version of themselves that you can hear. And that's what I go for. Yeah. There's been that. cases where I would co-write and I would play and I would do a whole lot more and it would be more of like this collaboration. But with those two, they don't need it. They, they're great as they are and and all i do is just help them just i guess you could say that that um they're on the field i'm the coach and i just help them play the best game yeah yeah and which I'm is kind sure of where i want to be in life i want to i'm ready to get off the field and be the coach yeah um uh ron i really want to thank you for this this great interview it was very insightful and of course for the uh birthday song in the beginning that, that was great too um but the last question i have for you i mean since you have such a unique and unorthodox style i was wondering who were some of your influences uh growing up it was always just bands and music growing up in the 70s surrounded by constant incredible music that was just coming out. Hey, here's a new one from Queen. Hey, here's a new one from Led Zeppelin. Hey, here's a new one from The Who. Hey, here's a new album from Pink Floyd. It's like the greatest music just freshly being heard. And it was always that. So it started off with the Beatles and Kiss, hearing Kiss Alive when it just came out. I was five years old. And that is what made me want to live a life of music was hearing that album. That was the inspiration. It wasn't guitar players. It was really, it was songs. It was songs and bands. Bands where they had such unique 
musical personalities that you can hear and how they come together and form something that nothing else could ever be. That was always what I loved. Until I heard Eddie Van Halen. And when I heard Van Halen, I was like, all right, guitar is not just a utility for songs. It's really a whole voice in its own and can play such a different role for it. Like if you look at Van Halen albums, before that, there weren't so many albums that suddenly had some one minute interlude of guitar doing something and, and just having guitar be like the second voice. Like there was always the pairing of the singer and the guitar player as like that, that dual focal point in a way. I mean, great bands, everyone was a focal point, bands like Led Zeppelin, but there was always that. You know, Steve Tyler, Joe Perry, so Axel and Slash. Uh, there's always that pairing that happened in rock music. But with Van Halen, I mean, Eddie, you could all say Eddie and Angus were almost like the front men of the band. Just as much, if not often more than the singer. Yeah. So it was a lot of that. And once once Eddie opened that door and said, okay, everyone has permission to get as creative and unique and explorative, if that's a word, exploratory uh, on guitar as you possibly can, go do it. Then there's Vi and Ingbe and all these other guitar players and, and just the world of, you know, the era of those guitar heroes. So I, of course, kept up with all of that. Uh, so yeah, it was kissing the Beatles and 60s, 70s music, and then Eddie Van Halen, and also, you know, just a lot of British metal. And then when uh, old school metal first came out, you know, you had Iron Maiden and things like that, and, and huge Maiden fans, still am, always will be. Uh, Queensryche and that whole scene, big on that and all the British prog groups, the progressive groups, UK, uh, you know, Alan Holdsworth stuff, uh, King Crimson and ELP and Yes and Jethro Tull, so many. So all of that as well. And then you, you just keep on exploring. So Charlie Christian and the old blues and jazz dudes and uh, everything and everyone and getting into classical Segovia and, and getting into uh, Demiola and Paco and Lucia and so yeah there's a whole world and timeline of music that you could spend the rest of your life finding incredible things. Um Ron, one of the questions that I really want to ask you is that in uh, 2019, um, you joined the band Asia, and uh, I saw you guys uh, play in Lewiston, New York, on the Royal Affair Tour, and uh, it was a pretty mind-blowing experience seeing you front Asia, not not just as the guitarist, but as the guitarist's lead vocalist, and there was even a point in that uh, performance where Steve Howe came and played the last four songs, and you were just the, the main vocalist. <laughs> Which, I mean, that in itself must have been a little bit weird for you because I don't think I've ever seen you perform without your guitar. Not very often, only if I'm drunk at karaoke. <laughs> Which maybe happened, you could count on one hand how many times that has happened in my life. So Asia, uh, that started back in 2016 where uh, I was friends with the tour manager of the band. And he's also Carl Palmer's personal manager. And he was putting together this group, this like all-star kind of band, where it was Carmine Apice on drums, it was Rudy Sarzo on bass, and Jeff Downs from Asia on keys, and Phil Naro on vocals from Talis, and wonderful guy, uh, may he rest in peace. And uh, the other guitar player besides myself was Gene Cornish of the Rascals. Wonderful guy. And we're so different 
uh, musically, how we play, the things we've done, but I'm a huge fan of the Rascals and the Young Rascals. So that was <laughs> very exciting for me. I don't know if I ever told him what a fanboy I was, but, or showed it, but yeah, and he's such a great guy. So we did a couple of shows in 2016, and from that, that's where the whole Asia connection really happened, uh, from working with the tour manager and with Jeff Downs directly working together. So in 2017, uh, the manager reached out, the tour manager, and he asked me if I would play guitar for them for the upcoming tour opening for Journey. But at that point, I was very busy getting Sons of Apollo off the ground and second Art of Anarchy album had just come out. So it wasn't a good time to leave and go tour doing something else. I needed to stick with all of that. So years later, uh, 2019, they had another tour where they were going to open for Yes. And I was not going to say no to that. Uh, huge Yes fan. And schedule, it was doable. So I said, yes, I will do that. So I was going to be the guitar player and they had a singer. I was just going to play guitar. And then the singer couldn't do it. So they all just said, why don't you have Ron do it? He could sing it. Let him sing it. So after vowing I would never be the replacement guy in another band, now I'm fronting the band. So, so I said, yes, okay, I'll do it. And then I went to sing the stuff. And, you know, this is like half a year before as I'm prepping for it and, and getting familiar with all the songs. I'm going online and seeing what gear uh, Steve Howe used in the studio and trying to make uh, you know, things that sound like it and just getting to know all the vocals and everything and checking all of their I was really doing my homework, a lot of homework. I was checking from their first tour to their last tour, my videos of them and different versions of the band and everything and seeing how they just approach things live. And I really realized when I would hear other people singing the songs that if it doesn't sound like John Wetton singing those songs, it's not going to sound like the band. So I spent months changing how I sing and trying to figure out how to sound like John Wetton. Because normally I have this bright, high range, brassy, vibrato kind of voice, old school metalish kind of voice when I sing, and he is not that. You know, just solid pitch, not a lot of vibrato, a totally different kind of tone, uh, you know, not blaring on the ahs and the es, it was more on the es and the oos, and just trying to get it where when I'm staring at a few thousand people that I don't just go into my default singing mode that I always normally did for my entire life. So I spend eight hours a day, every day, working on how I sang, changing it until I automatically would just sing that way. Totally different type of voice and different approach and everything until that was comfortable and that became the way I sang. So that was my preparation. And then besides doing that, you know, there's two different human beings doing the guitar parts and the vocal parts. It would be much easier to play bass and sing the parts because that's done by one same person and the, the parts interlock but the guitar parts are flowing all around the song. So I had to, besides doing that vocally, I had to figure out how, or just, just practice, 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 and get it so that I can have two separate things going at once. The guitar parts are doing their own thing and the vocals doing their thing, singing like a different person and tap dancing on the floor where I'm changing settings for the guitar with my left foot and changing vocal settings for my right foot where something like we were doing video killed the radio star from the Buggles. that was you know one of jeff down songs so i had to make a besides playing the guitar part 
I had a megaphone where I would do the opening verses with that. And then I immediately had to like put that down and just do the oh, oh, and then make a megaphone sound on the foot pedal that I was controlling for the vocals and have that sound like a megaphone and then switch it off into a doubler that didn't sound like that for the oh, oh, oh put it back. And then another setting where I made a, a smart harmony that would follow when I sang video kill the radio star, it would do the video kill the radio star so that I was doing my own harmony and then switching that back to the megaphone sound while playing guitar. And so it was a lot of coordinating to get it right. Yeah. So that was it. And the guys in the band, absolutely wonderful, every one of them. And the manager and all the yes guys, just the sweetest guys you could hit the road with and be with and hang with. And I remember when we were doing our uh, uh, preparations for everything. I remember one time we went out to P.F. Chang's and Alan White joined us and we all had a wonderful meal. And then uh, Alan, he drank a little bit that night and when it was getting towards the end of the night. He started taking the chopsticks and was playing drums on all the glasses and breaking the glasses. And the waitress came over. She's like, is everything all right here? I was like, yes, yes, everything is fine. Everything is good. We're out of here soon because we're breaking stuff and being loud. And, and uh, there's such a bunch of rock stars. Uh, so then it's time to leave. And he wouldn't leave. He was staying in the booth. He didn't want to go. I was like, oh, we got to go. It's time. We got to. You know, we'll, we'll continue at the bar at the hotel. Let's go back there. And, and he didn't want to leave. Uh, that, that was my personal Ellen White moment. And then we all got back to the hotel and hung out in the bar there and, and just hanging and just great bunch of guys. Uh, yeah, on and off stage, wonderful. Wow, so Alan Alan White was a rock star to the very end of his life, pretty much. Oh, yeah, he was the most of all. I'm like, I got to go to sleep. It's 10 p.m. I have to get to bed. And he's pounding drinks and breaking shit. <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely, he had the spirit. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Was there ever any consideration of recording with Asia while you were in the band? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know where it would go. And we didn't talk too much about it. It was just, we're doing the tour. It was the first tour since John Wetton had passed. So the main thing, at least for me, was to just pay good tribute to him. And we had screens on the back that would show scenes of him. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was pretty emotional, that part of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, why, why did you uh, decide not to continue with it? Or are well, you still involved? What happened was uh, Sons of Apollo had a tour that we had to keep rescheduling because of the pandemic. And then when we finally rescheduled it, about two days, we were still adding dates to it. So I held off on letting Asia's manager know, I was like, hey, we just moved it from January to August. And about two days before I got the final thing, when, when I was gonna let him know, he hit me up, he said, we got a tour in August. I'm like, no! And I couldn't have Sons of Apollo reschedule a fifth time. It was screwing the promoter every time that happened. And, had to do it. I was like, is there any way that tour is, is everything locked in or can it move a little before, a little after? And they couldn't move it. And so they were getting someone else. That tour ended up not even happening. And I think that tour had moved to what was going to be early this year and still didn't happen. So, and now at this point, uh, yeah. I don't know if I would do it again. I mean, I, I love them. I love the music. Everything about it was wonderful. But I'm just not looking to tour so much anymore. So, yeah. But I'm glad we got to do it. I'm glad it was, yeah, it was great. 
Yeah, like I said, I was there. I witnessed the show, and, and it was it was pretty magical, to be quite honest. I mean, that whole evening, that whole Royal Affair tour was something else. Um, and uh, it, it, I was uh, wondering, um, what was it like, you know, playing with someone like Steve Howe also? And, and he must have been a guitar hero of yours. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. I mean, one of the first albums I heard as a kid was Going for the One when it had just come out. And still to this day, I think that's one of the greatest masterpieces of an album that was ever made. Five of the most beautifully put together songs you could ever listen to. Uh, and they opened with the song Going for the One. So that was just such a thrill hearing them do that. So playing with everybody was fantastic. I played with Jeff before and, and he's a just wonderful guy. And Billy Sherwood, killer bassist, and, and also wonderful guy. And uh, Carl Palmer, yeah. It was usually be the two of us at Soundcheck, and he would be running around the venue, listening in different spots and listening to my guitar saying, uh, turn up the, this frequency right here. It sounds like it's a little thin in this part of the venue. Like he cared so much. And man, does he pound those drums. He was so, his drums were so loud on stage. Man, does he hit. Yeah, great dude. Yeah, fun guy. I wish I had his energy. Yeah. And yeah, and then Steve Howe would come out and he would, you know, he was rock solid. He would just play the stuff and I would put down my guitar and I was like, Steve Howe, yes. And sometimes uh, I would go over and I would sing to him where you make these kind of facial expressions like we're sort of talking to each other on stage, like, like I'm singing to him and he's going, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I try not to laugh. And yeah, great bunch of guys. Now you uh, said that in this gig, I mean, you were, you were singing this, the lead vocalist, guitarist for the first half of the show. Um, in retrospect, you feel that that was the most challenging gig that you've ever had in your career? Um, <laughs> you know, there's different aspects of things are challenging. Some are personally challenging. Some are physically challenging. Some are mentally challenging. Uh, this one, I would say, was challenging as far as coordinating all of that stuff. So in that sense, it was the most challenging gig. Other ones, if you're playing with a bunch of rotten human beings, that could be challenging in, in other ways, you know, in, in a way that you just wish you could get that filth out of your life. Uh, and then there's stuff where, you know, it's just technically challenging, like doing Sons of Apollo and trying to figure out what the hell I played for those guitar solos and nailing them down again. And yeah, and then there's when I would do solo shows. I would be singing and playing, doing crazy stuff on both ends. And that would be pretty challenging as well, technically and coordinationally. Yeah. So yeah, each gig can have its challenge. And definitely Asia doing that was a good challenge. Yeah. It was one I liked. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to make this work. Yeah. The only thing that was bad with it is uh, I was using in-ears, which I hate using. I like hearing it in the venue and it feels like I'm there, but I had to use in-ears. And what I didn't realize until later watching videos back is that my perception of what I was hearing in the in-ears was actually throwing off my sense of pitch. And for a lot of the gigs, I was singing slightly flat and it sounded right in my ears and I was actually off. And I remember like halfway through the tour, I started hitting up like Mark Slaughter and Tony Harnell. I was like, what do I do? How do I fix this? Uh, I think I'm right. So what do I do if I think I'm right and I'm actually wrong? Uh, and they gave me a couple of tips and ideas and, and sometimes I would try and keep an ear out. Uh, but that was the only thing, if I could go back in time, if I could just sing everything sharper in my mind so it would be right when it's heard. That's the only thing that I, I just like kick myself for is that my perception using in-ears of my vocal pitch was, was actually flat when I thought I was on. It's a weird thing, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought you sounded amazing when I saw you. So maybe it was fixed by then. Um, but I, um, I thought you sounded great. 
I'm good. Well, thank you. Thanks. Now, um, you because of of your your talent, your reputation, there are a lot of um uh, musicians that want to perform with you and have over the years. But is there any like one particular musician that you haven't performed with yet that you would still like to? Oh, there are so many. I think it would be a lot of the music that I grew up with, a lot of the 60s and 70s classic rock people. Definitely. And of course, you got to throw in Dave Grohl. Everybody wants to play with Dave Grohl. Yeah. Um, who else? I'm trying to think. I mean, there's, I've played with a lot of people, like not just in bands, like one offs and things like that, from Brian May to Nancy Sinatra to like all kinds of people. And trying to think of who have I not played with that I would like to play with. Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, uh, Gene and Paul from Kiss. Uh, who else? God, uh, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, uh, Roger Daltrey, uh, so many. Yeah, you could just go go on the list. Stevie Wonder. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, while while we're on that subject, let's uh, let's end the interview with uh, you telling me what your um off the top of your head your five most favorite records of all time are. Oh God! See that changes every day every hour that could change so right okay. now on on october october 18th 2023 mm -hmm. what, what is it okay i'm just going to pick five that come to mind and this is from a list of hundreds uh i'll go with, yes going for the one i will go with beatles rubber soul tough choice there uh i will go with Man of War Battle Hymns. Hell yeah. I love Man of War. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially the, the first few albums uh, Into Glory Ride and, and yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, so let's see. That's three. Um, Muse Absolution and damn what is number five number five number five number five it's like i'm trying to fit a hundred albums through a funnel and have just one come out and they're all crammed okay yes okay that uh hmm. you know what queensrike rage for order brilliant album so ahead of its time these are five that popped in my head that I just absolutely love. Yeah. More for good measure. Yes. The extra one, the bonus one. New England, 1979. They opened for Kiss during that tour. Uh, phenomenal band. Uh, yeah. That's an album to look up and check out. Don't ever want to lose you. You know, yes. Yeah, I could go through that album right now and play you just off the top of my head every single song on that album. Hello, hello, hello Do you like me better now? Are you surprised to see me? I'll be waiting here I'll be waiting all night long And then I could play you that entire album front to back right now, sing it and play every song because I love it that much. Uh, yeah. Shoot but before that, there was a. Uh, uh, um, actually, it was D, wasn't it? Yeah, it was.
finishes up. side as well and, and yeah but I could literally I could play you that entire album right now if you'd like to hear it front to back I'm forgetting words because my brain just has a lot of Swiss cheese holes in it right now but still remember the melodies and, and yeah so yes New England uh yeah I was at that Kiss Dynasty tour where New England opened in Buffalo and uh, I, I saw them too. And, and for a lot of people, a lot of people I know, that was the first concert they went to. So technically, New England was the very first band that they ever saw live. Same. Yeah. It was in Madison Square Garden, 1979. So yeah, they were the first band before Kiss. So that was, for, and that was my first real show. So oh, well, that was yeah. really your first show. Wow. Yeah. Same. Yeah. It, it was my uh, fourth show. I saw Ted Nugent, then Triumph, and then ACDC opening up for UFO, and then New England Kiss wow. in Buffalo. Yeah. I saw Ted Nugent with Alcatraz opening in New York City in 1983, I think it was. Yeah, I, that, that was, I mean, yeah. we're, we're like seeing a lot of shows, like you're in New York City, I was in Buffalo, so I was probably seeing them like a day later. Than yeah. A day later. Yeah, I saw this, the Nugent one with Ingve Malmsteen in yeah. Alcatraz, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, wow, that's yeah. amazing. Oh, man, that was great shit. Yeah. Grand Bonnet. Still, man, what a powerful voice he has, Graham Bonnet. And did you know that my drummer, Kyle Hughes, on all my solo stuff, plays with Graham Bonnet? Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Like, currently? Yeah. Everyone's connected somehow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, that was great. Thank you very much for, for playing those songs for us here at, at the Rock Interview Series. I really appreciate that. Oh, you're, you're a fun interview. I could, I could interview you every day. <laughs> it's just a big hangout playing songs. Yeah. Well, we still have to do side two of New England. Do you remember what it'd be here like if you just were moving and I could turn out the lights? Jump ahead. to the whole piano song. joined the band Alcatraz. Yeah, the bassist and the keyboards, right? Aldo and Shay. Uh, and then uh, at the very end, ah, uh, wait, 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 uh, nice song, Encore. Just 
So remember all the solos too. Everybody should go out and check out that album. New England is the band. They're, they're just, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think after watching this interview, a lot of people will check that out. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I hope so. Yeah. Well, well Ron, uh, thank you again um, for, for coming back and like finishing up this interview. And, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah. anything else you'd like to add to, the, to finish this interview? I talk too much. No, I need to stop. I, I just talk and talk and talk. You, you need to get on with your day. You need to continue on with your life. I'm going to keep you here playing like all these songs and everything. No, stop me. Make me stop. Well, I would rather have you. I'm sure a lot of my viewers would rather have you talk than me. And you're much more <laughs> you know, and you're a much better guitarist. So, uh, yeah, that was it was fine. It was good. I love it. Thank you so much. You got it. Thank you again. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah, maybe even tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see you, Ron. Thank you so much. Have a much. great one. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.